Okay, welcome back. Um, we've been, we, we started our um, first class on introduction to counseling. We looked at uh, certain core elements of biblical counseling. Um, and I think as in the last uh, class that we had, there was one question that came up from one of the students. And uh, I think she's, she's, she requested, Anita requested to, for a little bit more of clarity about, um, about sanctification. Okay, and maybe I'll quickly try and uh, see how best. I know it's it's a huge topic, but uh, quickly try and explain this as best as possible. So I I trust you understood Anita what uh, justification is. So sanctification is a process um, by which you as a believer become more uh, conformed into Christ likeness or into the image of Christ. So you know we are redeemed when we believe and we trust Jesus as our Savior, we are redeemed, but yet we are imperfect. So as we become more conformed to who Christ is or to the likeness of Christ, we allow the rule and the reign of Jesus in our hearts to change us. And that becomes, uh, uh, and, and what you are moving into is a place of, of what we call as holiness. So while we may have been justified or positionally holy, that is because of our trust in Jesus, we still continue to, to sin. We know that we, we still sin. And that's why, you know, scripture refers to sanctification as a practical experience of our separation to God. So progressive sanctification is the obedience to God's word in our life and or it's the same as like you're growing in the Lord into sp spiritual maturity so what God God started the work of making us like Christ and he is continuing it till the day of approaching or till the day comes so it is for, for us as believers we are to pursue that as a believer earnestly and how is that done? Is it is by, um, by, it is it is put to effect by the word of God, by the application of God's word. So progressive sanctification is setting apart of those who are believe believers for the purpose for which we were sent to the world. You know, He's sent us to the world. Um, uh, he sanctified us, you know, so um, I think John 17, 19 says sanctify. Um, um, it says that they may too, for I, for them, I sanctify myself. Jesus is saying that they too may be truly sanctified so that Jesus set himself apart for God's purpose uh, in both the basis and the condition of our being set apart. So we are sanctified and sent because just like the way Jesus was. So. Jesus' sanctification is the pattern of and the power for our own. So we are being moved little by little every day into becoming more like Christ. And that's something that we, we continue doing, moving from a place of sin into a place of Christ-likeness. So that's what we are focusing on also in counseling, where it is a gradual Sanctif it is a sanctification, sanctification, a gradual move from being in a place of sinful nature to a place of being into Christ likeness. Okay, I hope I answered that uh, for you. All right. Okay. Great. Um, just, just kind of give me a minute. I'll just uh, share the screen. Okay. So moving on, let's look at to what are some of the basic tenets uh, of, of Christian counseling, okay? There may be certain overlaps, but uh, here I just would like to, these are like the pillars um, of, of counseling, okay? So let's just take some time to look at each of this one by one. So as we had, as we had said, the Bible is the sole and sufficient authority in counseling and dealing with problems. And there are certain scriptures that's given in your books. And, uh, you know, I'd, I would uh, encourage you to go back and read it. And why do we say that? Like we know, first, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says that scripture 
is inspired by God and it is profitable. That means it is useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction into righteousness. So the Bible has the authority and is enough to help people to move away from their places of problems because scripture gives instructions <clears throat> and correction to one and all. Okay, uh, the, 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16, uh, sorry, 3, 17 says that, that, that so that we can be complete, thoroughly equipped for, for every good work. So we can be sanctified into being useful for God. Okay, uh, uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 says that God's divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So everything that we need for our life and for our godliness is something that can be, is, is found in scripture. And that familiar verse of Hebrews 4.12 that says that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and it pierces even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So scripture is enough to help um, us to deal with the things, the problems of the soul, problems of the spirit, and problems of the mind. Okay, so that's the first tenet that we're looking at. The second one is to understand that the counseling of uh, Christian counseling is the work of God, and it is the Holy Spirit's ministry. So we we read that in. Um, um, John uh, 14, uh, John chapter 14, verses 15 to 17, that he's the one who convicts us of our sin. He's the one who uh, brings about um, that conviction of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Right? There are other scriptures <clears throat> that, that talks about that the work of God being um, uh, that, that counseling being the work of God. One is Romans 15, 13, that it says we abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We, we have a place of hope because of what the Holy Spirit has given us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that's another scripture that talks about how uh, no temptation has overtaken us that is not common uh, to man, but that God is faithful and he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what you're able uh, able to bear. But in those temptations, he will make a way of escape that you may be able to, to bear it. Okay, so the work of God, counseling is the work of God, and that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that he he's the one who convicts, he's the one who comforts, he's the one who brings about a process of, of change. Okay? Going to the next one, uh, certain biblical counseling principles that we need to have an understanding as we move ahead is one, to understand the nature of man. Okay, to understand that man is depraved. So, what does that mean? Man is depraved means man is totally wicked and is one who cannot save himself. And we see that in scriptures in Romans 3.23, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there is a depravity in every man, wickedness, sinfulness in every man. And, we, and all issues and problems come as a result of the fallen nature of man. And that's what separates us from, uh, separates us from God. So understanding that man any man is depraved is sinful is wicked okay to know that it is only christ and what he has done on the cross is our only means of salvation now when we say salvation we're using the word sozo here sozo to mean total salvation that's just not uh, salvation of the soul but healing for the body healing for the mind uh, all of that. So it is an encompassing salvation that only trust in Christ alone and his work on the cross is that means of salvation. And the only way for us to establish that relationship with God. And uh, we see that in scripture of 
um, you know, where, where it's, it says in Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no other name under heaven. Uh, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must saved, but by the name of Jesus. So that is our understanding that help and salvation and save saving grace and wholeness comes only because of trust in Christ alone. Okay, the third uh, tenet is the third one is that the agents of change. Who are the agents of change? The agents of change is not you as a counselor. You're a facilitator. The agent of change is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. As John sixteen eight says, that He comes to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So, as He convicts. As the word of God reveals, change happens. Okay, And the last one is submission. <clears throat> this is submission to Christ alone can bring about uh, a, a solution to the problems of man, which is caused by sin. Man trying to work his sinful nature on his own finds himself falling. And that's how that's what we would see that you know whenever we depend on our own strength on our own abilities, we do find getting back into a state of wickedness and sin. But submitting to Christ and His Word is that only solution for for man. So that's yet another uh, tenet. Okay, going on, the basic goal for counseling is um, as as you see here is. Um, uh, goal of counseling is to give direction or instruction from the Bible so that the counselee can achieve God's goals or his purposes in the person's life. And some scripture that I just want to bring out is uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 5, that says uh, that you know, the purpose for us is to love from a pure heart or from a good conscience or from faith. That's the purpose that God has called each one of us, each one of us to do. Or another scripture in your books is Colossians 1 27, 28. It is Jesus who you preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, so that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So the, the direction is is to become Christ-like and to fulfill the purposes of God. Okay. The next one is that the personal qualities of the counselor uh, needs to be um, spiritual and not just academic. Um, so when when we're looking at, uh, at at that, what we're saying is that. Yes, it is important to have skills in counseling, to know, to have a good knowledge, um, scientific understanding of what counseling is that makes you an efficient counselor. But the, the main quality of a Christian counselor is spiritual, is being one who is saved by the blood of the Lamb, one who is under the submission and authority and wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, one who is careful about teaching others uh, about, about God. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I like this verse which says in 1 Timothy 4.12, it says, keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right, and God will save you and those who hear you. So, and if, if you remember what one of the things that we had spoken about earlier was that every discipline, every discipline outside or every philosophy that comes must be tested and tried by the word of God. And so a counselor who is completely an academician <clears throat> uh, and is not spiritual tends to take on principle and philosophies that may be outside of what, what scripture talks about. So a counselor's qualifications needs just not to be, not merely academic, but it needs to be uh, spiritual, uh, spiritual as well. Okay. And, Can uh, I share something, Pastor? Yes, yes, please. This is Charles. Yes, Charles, go ahead. Yeah, I'm responding on uh, the academic part of it. I'm looking at the uh, places like rehabilitation centers, 
where these guys are really academic when they have studied these things from mm -hmm. universities mm -hmm. and they, they take someone in the rehabilitation center and that person is thought to have been rehabilitated is brought back home but in the next three days they are back into the same trap so when it is spiritual then it works there is change but when it is totally academic it will continue the cycle will again continue and there might not be any change thank you absolutely absolutely um uh, charles I, I, and and i think when you bought this i maybe i'm missing this point earlier when we were talking about sin being uh, the the fundamental issue that we need to help deal with to understand that spiritual problems become the root of very many physical and emotional problems right and uh, and in my next few slides where i'm going to give you a difference of biblical counseling or christian counseling and um, secular counseling this will be highlighted a little bit more is that the focus often tends to be on behavior but not the heart and as a result when you're trying to bring about a change only in the behavior without bringing a change in the heart, you will find yourself falling back into the same addiction or same kind of problem situation as you did earlier. So, so yes, uh, in counseling, going to the root of the problem is actually knowing that there has been separation between God and man because of the sin that's that's come in. And these, this is what I would say some of the uh, limitations in secular counseling because um, a lot of focus is given on the mind, focus is given on the body, focus given on uh, everything is on the mind, you know, the thought, will, and the emotions. But coming into the spirit uh, is something that often counselors or uh, secular counselors miss out, or maybe the counselee has has no orientation towards that and and feels that isn't a part of them so then you know it becomes very limited in its scope this is my personal uh experience and my personal understanding and thought okay all right uh we'll move to the uh, next point uh yeah so uh, as we were saying uh, as as a counselor uh or as a person who is in the body of christ helping becomes a responsibility uh, for each one of us, we are called. Uh, uh, you know, it is it is a process of helping. That is that is what we are called for, and we see that in many scriptures. In Romans fifteen fourteen, it talks of how you know we're filled with all knowledge, um, you know, because of our our um, love to Christ, and we are also called to uh, admonish and bear with one another. Or Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Uh, and, you know, we, we need to be exhorting one another. Again, James talks about this and says, if anyone uh, is away from the truth and, um, uh, you know, someone should turn him back and let him know that he's in error and that uh, and by doing so you're saving a soul from from death and you're covering over a multitude of sins so we are called to to respond in that in that process of helping to be able to be in a place of helping um, those who are in need okay again uh, I think we've spoken about this. The ultimate aim of counseling is to ensure that they grow in maturity of Christ, that uh, uh, by doing so, the person is free to be able to worship and to serve God, and as a result, growing in their strength and their maturity in Christ. And last, of course, uh, I'll take that question. I'll just complete this. And last, of course, prayer becomes an integral part of um, uh, of counseling uh, and what would this this it, it becomes an important aspect because the use of prayer and scriptures during these sessions uh, you know what you're doing is you're actually asking God for discernment and sensitivity uh, on your part um, especially you know if the client is not a Christian and um, sometimes I've seen that the use of proper timing with regard to prayer and scripture uh, can in counseling can be very important and and i and i state um, you know testament to this 
like I said, I do see a lot of people who aren't believers. Uh, and um, there may be times, especially when they are going through significant uh, stress and strain, something that doesn't even, there's no hope. There doesn't seem any form of a solution uh, in in the way forward. And just the use of prayer at that time. So I, let me give you an example. So uh, I was meeting with this client um, uh, who was an unbeliever, uh, and uh, she was trying to cope with, with the illness of her husband and he was significantly ill for around two years had almost lost um, him to death because of the severity of the illness but recovered many times and the time that she came to me was the third uh, cycle of illness that came about and she called me uh, one evening uh, right after our session, a couple of hours after our session and, uh, you know, broke down saying that, uh, you know, she's fearful that her husband may not live, uh, he may not survive the night. And, um, you know, it, it, I, that was, I think, the best time or the opportune moment for me to tell her that, uh, you know, um, uh, that that it it is a very difficult time for her and would she be okay if i pray alongside with her because i believe that uh, something that a human person cannot do is i cannot restore him but i you know i believe in a god who can uh, who can do that restoration and healing and she was very open to it and uh, she immediately took to it and I just prayed a very simple prayer asking for healing over her husband and she calls me two days back and she said you know they had to go to the hospital but there was a there was a turnover that happened um, and and that was pub and that was maybe the only time that I spoke to her about it. But it came up later in a conversation of she says, you know, I remember that you know you supported me through prayer, and that was very encouraging. So there is a time that you use. There is a proper timing for it and use of prayer or even use of scripture. And I remember another time when when a uh, when a woman, uh, uh, you know, she was caught in her adultery, and her husband was extremely mad at her. And uh, her her mm. her so-called lover had uh, uh, you know pulled his back and uh, exposed her to her husband, and she felt extremely betrayed and extremely dejected. Um, so then you know, and she she called um, you know in the session she said you know I'm, I just don't have peace of mind, and and I said I said you know um, there are, would you be okay if I send you some some material that will help to uh, to calm your mind. Um, and I said, it is taken from the Bible. So I did take her permission. And I said, would you be OK if I sent that to her? And she readily agreed. And I, and I sent her a couple of Psalms, um, you know, and uh, she, she kept reading it. And a couple of days later, she actually messaged saying, you know, that's been so uplifting. I've never uh, read something like this before. So, so there may be times like this that you just probably add in certain seeds, but it can, it can be very, very useful and helpful. Okay. Uh, yes, Mangi, I think you have a question. Would you like to bring your question, Mangi? Thank you, Pastor. Yes. Um, at the beginning of, of, of the chapter of the, of the book, when you, you, you were telling us about what counseling is not about, uh, mm -hmm. you say that it's not, it's not going in with our own perspective. It's not uh, giving advice, but yet in a in the basic tenets, uh, point three, third, third one, say that we, we give biblical instruction. So it's say, the goal of biblical counseling is to give instruction from the Bible so that mm -hmm. the counselee can achieve mm -hmm. goals. So mm -hmm. does, it not, does that not contradict the, contradict the first point? You say that it's not giving advice, so it's, not, it's allowing the uh, counselee coming up mm -hmm. with their own uh, solutions. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, extremely good question. So, let me let me bring a context to this. Okay. Now, um, uh, in remember in Christian counseling, we are understanding that the basis for counseling is the Bible, is the Scripture, and something we do in the center in in the center at APC, the counseling center at APC, is we disclose what are 
our, our foundational principles and beliefs. So we have a consent form and we write in it that um, uh, that we are uh, we are uh, scripturally based, although we do use psychological techniques. Okay, so there is an understanding that any any form of the orientation that we have towards counseling is biblical based. Now, what does that mean? So, if my counselee is someone who is a believer and a Christian, what I do is um, open what Scripture shows about a certain condition or a certain situation. I open that up for them. I, I, I uh, uh, bring about what scripture instructs about a certain problem or a certain situation. And that's something that scripture has written. So, and, and what I do with the counselee is ask them what it means to them or whether it speaks to them or it has revealed something to them. So there the counselee is free to say, I know that, but I don't want to obey it, or I see it, let me have time to think about it, or yes, God is revealing something to me. So my responsibility is to open up the perspective of what scripture brings, and then allow the counselee to take a decision on their own. Okay, now looking at a person who is not a believer, what I do is, I so so does that mean in my secular counseling, I don't stand on the principle of what scripture says? Yes, I do. I do. Um, so you will never hear me advising someone, like, for example, someone's coming in with a divorce and they're saying, you know, I want to divorce someone. So I wouldn't ever say, you know, I think you're making a great decision. I wouldn't say that. But what I would do is, can we think about the situation? Can we think about the pros and the cons of a divorce or the pros and the cons of a whatever the situation may be? Let's think about it and um, help you try and come with a basic understanding of it. So what I would do is to present perspectives. And even scripturally, I present a biblical principle or present a biblical perspective and allow the counselee to come to a place of decision making. Okay, because like we said, the, 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 the work of counseling is the Holy Spirit. So I'm a facilitator to open up instruction or to open up what scripture talks about and ask the counselee what meaning it makes for them and whether that could help to change some form of their, their situation or their behavior. So, so that's what we would do. We're not saying, you know, this is what the Bible instructs you to do and this is what you should do. Go do it and come back. No, I would say... You know, being a believer, let's also, uh, from all the as practical aspects that the counselee has brought in, I will also bring about a biblical aspect and say, this is what scripture says, what does that mean to you? What do you think, um, how do you think that speaks to you? Or how does it speak to your situation? So to help them to come to a place of uh, exploring what the word says, understanding it, and then putting that forward into action is, is what I would do. So did I under, did I answer your question, Mangi? Yes, you did. Thank you so much. Okay. Pastor. All right. Great. Okay. Good. So um, I have I have a follow up. I have a follow up to yes, think Charles. about Go ahead. that. Um, if I heard clearly, that means that you are not advising them, but you are suggesting possible ways. Your advice might be coming, but you are giving them. Uh, possible ways on how they can handle it, maybe using the word of God, but you are not directly telling them, do this, do this, do this. You bring suggestions and then you, you walk them through the suggestions and they can come up with the new revelations, with the new findings. Is that the way or? Yeah, so what we're doing is now, even in secular counseling, uh, so with all the confusion that uh, a counselee may come in, what you're helping them to do is to look at the situation through different perspectives. And so that's what you're doing. You, you know, you as a counsellor, because you are not emotionally involved with the person, you may be able to see in the line of scripture what are some of the areas that they may be missing out. 
So as a counselor, what you're doing is through conversation, you're also presenting certain perspectives and saying, you know, have, what do you think about, uh, um, okay, so let me at the, at the end make it, give it to you in an example, maybe easier. Um, so we'll take Susan for that matter, all right? So Susan, Susan uh, uh, feels something about her husband, okay? And of course, now this is not the first line of, uh, uh, you know, response. Please remember, this is not the first line of response. This will probably be in my probably third or fourth or fifth session that we are bringing about a discussion like this, okay? So what we are helping her see, now she was very focused on the individual, on her husband. Now, what we are also helping her do is to look at what ways do you think, uh, you know, you may be contributing to the entire situation. So you've given her a different perspective. Rather than keeping it focused on the person of her husband, in time, you are helping her to look within herself to see uh, what is it that is that is within her that is probably giving her a sense of a um, uh, a color of her husband like this. So what would be going on inside of her? So that's a perspective change. So you're helping her see, you know, would you like to look at within yourself to see um, what is it that that may be contributing to this very problem in the relationship? So that's a different perspective. So similarly, you are opening up a different perspective by opening up scripture, by showing instructions from scripture and helping them to come to a place of exploration. So giving perspectives is something that you do in counseling because often counselees come with a very single focused mind and say, okay, this is what I want to do. And uh, But they have not looked at different other aspects in relation to that or anything surrounding it. So yes, we do give perspectives and help the counsellor to counsellee to come to a place of judgment and determining their own uh, way forward in the situation. So yes. Okay. All right. So let's go on um, to the to the next couple of slides. Um, just uh, just quickly. And this isn't in your book, but uh, I just felt it was necessary for us to understand that. You know, the study of the human mind is what psychology is and why do we need to use psychology and is it okay to use principles in psychology? So this is a couple of my understanding and that, that I've put forth. Uh, so you, it is, it's important, like, for example, when you do business, you would draw from management principles, right? Or if you are into a healing ministry, you would also draw from practical understanding of the human body and the science and treatment and things like that. So God has given us um, different things that help, you know, has, has brought about wisdom and understanding through his people um, uh, to, to give us a better understanding of things and how do we relate. So we use psychology number one, to have a better understanding of what human behavior is about. However, in our next in our next to next class, in the third week, we are going to be looking at understanding man, right, through the Bible. So because you need to understand personality in order to understand how you can help, right? So we're going to be looking at that also. But in psychology, you get to have a good understanding of human behavior, and that's why we use that. Now, psychology can definitely offer you insights that improve on your counseling skills as to uh, what would a certain skill help you enhance, <clears throat> um, what kind of questions are helpful, uh, what, what are best responses that you can get when you say something. So yes, psychology de definitely offers this kind of uh, good um, insights to help you with that. Okay, it also helps you to understand how problems interact to psychological symptoms. So there may be, like we said, you know, we we have an understanding that all problems. Uh, most problems can be spiritual in nature. Uh, sorry, it's not all. Some problems can be spiritual in nature, right? And uh, so to, to know that how that gets manifested into a psychological symptom, like for, for someone who is um, um, significantly depressed over time, 
right? Uh, it it helps you understand what you know when when you really look into the spiritual being of the person, what has been. Uh, you know, their experiences with people, their experience, the way that they see God, maybe their life uh, or, or the kind of uh, issues that they've been, they've been struggling with in their spirit, it manifests out in some emotional or behavioral problems. So it gives you a good understanding of these interactions that, that take place, you know. Uh, and, and because when you're coming from a spiritual background, you do also see how the needs that a that man has in specific needs a man has how that translates into uh, into certain psychological symptoms like for example let's say uh, you know we as a, as people as human beings we all have a need to be loved need to be accepted okay and um, how does that manifest uh, with psychological symptoms maybe it is a craving of attention or it may be um, you know very flamboyant hysterical behavior now so that helps you to connect that you know okay the person is someone who is in a very needy a person who needs a lot of acceptance and love and this is how they are psychologically manifesting it so psychology helps you to understand that however <clears throat> the uh, something that I had spoken about earlier is the caution that we need to develop a strategy to evaluate these principles in the light of scripture. So there are so many um, techniques and theories that come about that we need to be very careful to see if they fall in the line of scripture, okay? And uh, that, of course, requires us discerning and reading and researching uh, and, you know, maybe even, even insights by talking to, um, uh, to, to people who are strong in the word to, to give us a basic understanding of what strategy we may be using, okay? Uh, I just want to go forward. Uh, can you all see the slides? Are you able to see the slides? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Okay. Now, uh, just a couple of, um, uh, just a few differences to help you to understand, you know, what, what are we looking at when we're saying about differences. Uh, in, uh, so the, the first and foremost, the central belief in uh, uh, biblical counseling is that God is supreme, that he is the one who is Lord over everything over a man's will, a man's mind, a man's life, everything. He is supreme. Whereas in secular counseling, the central belief is that the self is supreme, that I am the ruler of everything. I control everything. I'm able to make the changes that I want. But if you look in biblical counseling, there is always a dependence on God, dependence on scripture, dependence on the Holy Spirit to bring about change or to bring about any form of an action. So that becomes the central difference and that's what the central belief is. <clears throat> okay, In biblical counseling, uh, the Bible becomes the base for wisdom, guidance and advice. Whereas in secular counseling, it's more introspection, examination of the self and the will that brings about the change. Now, I'll give you a very simple example. So I'm meeting um, a, a woman, a married woman, who uh, who is into polyamory, which means being in multiple relationships while being married, and also, you know, all the partners being aware of this relationship. Now, uh, this, this, uh, this woman, uh, she, she comes with, with the understanding or she, she knows, or deep within her heart, she knows that what she's doing is definitely not right and is destructive to her mind, her uh, soul, her body, her relationships. Very well aware. But is in a place where uh, she does not want to move away from that life into something else because there is the need to feel 
that the self will becomes very predominant. I don't want to change. This is the way that I am. I don't want to change for anybody else. Although this is giving me these many problems, you know, I, I still want to continue this way. So this is a person I've been seeing for the last couple of months, I think around four or five months. And, uh, you know, the fact that uh, she's, she's stuck with me through these four months and through every conversation, what I'm doing is I'm helping her see this lifestyle and what it is doing to her the misery that it's bringing her, the bondage that she's in. And every time, you know, she comes in and says, you know, I just understand that this is just not the way to go, but I can't give it up, right? So what happens is the self becomes, like I said, the self becomes extremely supreme. And for a person who does not know God or does not know the word of God, opening up scripture is the biggest and the idealist thing to do and the best thing to do however there is there is a it, there is a blindness that comes that it is okay to be in a life of sin so what happens is that's why you would find secular counselors to say you know go do what makes you feel right but nobody ever helps them to understand that makes you feel right definitely has a lot of <clears throat> consequences to it, a lot of damaging results to it. And this, again, like I said, so I was just bringing out the difference to help you see that this becomes one of the basic differences between um, secular counseling and biblical counseling. Okay. The next one is, there is the premise to understand that man is sinful and fallen, which makes him separate from God. That is the understanding we have. Whereas in secular understanding is that every man is good. They're innately good. They are, they are good right from the start. And no matter what they do, it is okay. And they are capable of solving their own problems. Okay, So the focus is a lot on the individual rather than on the creator. Okay, next, uh, the difference is the absolute truth is the Bible. And that becomes the yardstick for measuring truth. That's what is in biblical counseling. But in secular counseling, there's no absolute truths. It is, if this is right for you, go ahead and do it. If that doesn't seem right for you, it's okay. Right? So that's that becomes, again, the premise there. The other difference is that uh, in biblical counseling, problems are solved on God's standards. And like we said, the Bible becomes the instructional book for that guidance and advice. That is, in secular counseling, the problems are solved on the terms of the world's standards and for anything that creates that happiness and success. So if I'm happy, then I'm good. right? If I'm successful, then I'm good. There has, there's very little to do with working out the spirit. Now, even as I'm saying this, it doesn't mean that all clients, all counselees who come who are secular, don't do the searching. A lot of them search. And a lot of them are looking for the deeper meaning of what all of this is about. And that becomes the most opportune time to open up scripture. And, and, I've, and I've done that a couple of times, you know, when they say everything seems so meaningless. There's nothing. I mean, I just begin to see there's nothing in me that can bring about happiness. There has to be something more. And that becomes the best and the opportune time to open up scripture. Okay. The next difference is the premise that biblical counseling holds is that the ma that man's purpose is to bring glory to God and have sufficiency in him alone. Everything comes from God. Everything goes back to God. Whereas in secular counseling, it's that the man's purpose is to be independent and be self-sufficient and to realize their own potential for full human expression. Okay. So you see that, that, that it's, it's, a lot to do with the self. It is about building the self. Biblical counseling, the dependence is on the Holy Spirit. In secular counseling, dependence is on personal autonomy. Okay, that each person to their own, each one to their own. Yeah? 
Uh, biblical counseling, the scripture validates man is totally accepted and is of self-worth regardless of performance. Then, like You don't have to do anything or you don't have to be in a place of performance to, or do anything in order to be accepted. Whereas in the world system, its self-worth is always based on something. It's on a performance, it's on accomplishment, it's on approval, it's on acceptance of others. Okay. The last one is that true satisfaction is found in a relationship with God and the pursuit of godliness in biblical counseling. Whereas in secular counseling, a lot of the counseling approaches are need-based. They believe that if their needs are met, they will be people who are happy, as against in biblical counseling, where it is a relationship with God that brings about happiness. So what should we, how do we integrate this well? is number one, to understand that psychology must come under the authority of scripture, to know that Bible is the inspired and the revelation of God that has no falsity in it. Uh, and to know that the biblical principles is not only, uh, it's, it's not just a doctrine, but it's something that even a counselor is practicing. And that's what you bring about as a perspective uh, to a counselee. And uh, you truly integrate it well when you weed out or you take away any, el uh, any elements of psychology that is opposing to what God says in, in his word. Okay. All right. I'm open for any specific uh, questions that you all may have at this point of time. We are close to uh, an hour on. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Yes, Samuel, go ahead. So, Pastor, so for, you know, let's say in the secular context, and this may not necessarily be in a counselor, counselee um, environment. It could just be like, let's say, in the office amongst colleagues or, you know, let's say a, a new, like in maybe more in the pack, um, like let's say I'm, I'm, I'm in the office and there's a new joinee who is put under me or maybe I'm in a work where uh, my job is to help young kids. Like, so more in a secular context. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the things that we looked at, so um, I don't know, so, but maybe this is my own limitation, but uh, let me put the, like, let's say where um, the opportunity of just opening a Bible and, you know, exploring biblical principles is limited or, you know, is, is, is uh, something probably a little weird to do, like, let's say, you know, hmm. so where it's just, it's just about uh, people looking at you um, or looking at you for advice or, or depending on you as the team leader or anything in that in, in that sense and um and and um so i'm so i'm thinking and i would probably uh, depend on some of the secular principles that you showed like uh, autonomous uh, you know, yeah. like autonomy is something that you know in in this organization the more autonomous mm. you become, you're valued more, um, mm. and things like that. Uh, right. You know, so I mean, so I don't see it as wrong, but I'm I'm trying to I'm just trying to wrap my head. I mean, so so again, this is not counseling, counseling per se, but just uh, a, a a a way of approach um, in the world where people aren't coming to you for counsel but uh, at the same time you are mentor to somebody or you're your team leader to a bunch of people and you're just doing some aspects of a counselor mm -hmm. um, so is it how like i wouldn't say bad but like you know depending uh, like so applying some of the secular principalities of counseling so, so is, is that I mean in, in a way it is limiting because eventually we would want everyone to uh, come to God and be reconciled with God but but at the same time I think there is some limitation so I, I don't know there probably there are multiple questions so one is is it okay to stay in that realm and two is um, you know how does one uh, 
so it's like secular counseling has limitation but in that context how does one uh, bring about biblical counseling mm. okay so since you did bring it up as uh, you know and i'm and i'm taking that question not in the form of counseling but but general interactions with people so uh, it is it's not like you said it's not wrong to be self aware to build yourself to determine things for yourself it's not wrong what uh i i think the issue happens when you lord everything else around the self when the self becomes the lord of your life because you and i understand that the more there is a dependence kept on the self that one day you will begin to see it all crumble maybe it helps at the point of time you know self improvement and self development and self growth yes it, it it does help but there will come a point of time when your resources become deplete when your self resources become deplete so practically how do we deal with something like that i think in your in, in the case that you spoke about it is an example that you show maybe you being a team lead and you have some you know kids under you to in through your example or your lifestyle or through your decision making uh exhibiting that your dependence is not just on your own wisdom and knowledge and strength and skill but that your dependence is on somebody greater than you and that it comes from there and that may not be like a teaching position that may be more like a being position where you are living that kind of a lifestyle or even in similar uh, you know simple conversations you know someone comes to you and says hey you know you did so well you're such a disciplined person or you're you're so this and just being able to give a response that is fitting and saying you know i know where that comes from on my own i can't do it i know but then i i seek the help of of the lord in my life in doing that now those are ways that you show your dependence now in counseling we were talking about in secular counseling it is not raw like you said it's not wrong to do that but it is limiting it is it you can you can take them halfway to the race but the rest of the race you've left them on guard they don't know how to go forward so that's what i meant by limiting do people use these approaches yes they do i mean that's what the entire world is doing you know using these approaches to build uh the self and the qualities of the self to deal with their with their situation but it's not lasting it's not something that has a firm ground or a firm foundation so that's what i said by by it is it becomes limiting and the essence uh, so whenever i meet with a counselor counselee who is not a believer this is this one thing that i have in mind that they need to begin to see how much of themselves they cannot depend on that they need to come to a place of seeking to say there is somebody more than this something more than this that can fulfill the deeper needs of my heart those critical needs that maybe a relationship can't that money can't that that uh, that um, you know fame can't that a position can't because all of this at a point of time is going to fade so to get them to come to that place is where you know that that's the goal that i generally do have and i meet with a with with a counselor to to get them to a place of seeking yes i may be helping them to develop skills of their own because they don't have anything else they they are void of anything else but to encourage them to also say okay great this is what you're doing right now but you may need to think deeper into finding out what is within yeah i hope i didn't ramble and i answered your question samuel uh christopher uh would you like to bring Thank your you. question yeah. christopher i think you have a question yes um yeah can you can you hear me pastor yes yes i can yeah. i can just yeah so i i just want to actually uh, i just can to turn a little bit because you are in this particular case of this uh, uh, you had mentioned about this uh, poly amorous uh, uh, you know the woman who was uh, involved in that um, way of life um 
just wanted to understand, you know, what was what was some of the reasons for her to I mean, prompting her to come to you for help, knowing that you come from a very you know spiritual background, and uh, also from your from your uh, from where you came from, what what made you uh, you know decide that you know you would you would want to take on a possibly quite a complicated case. Mm. And um, in that process, uh, or right now you mentioned a couple of months, I think you've you've uh, you're probably uh, you know focused more on not so much on the spiritual side, but uh, how do you sort of go about uh, you know um, in the in the first like in, in the initial stages, how is how do you kind of you know um, not really uh, you know do Christian counseling, but you know, you're focusing more on uh, maybe maintaining trust, I mean, sorry, developing trust and, you know, just after that, uh, how do you go about uh, doing that? So mm. uh, that's that's really my question. Okay, two okay. questions ahead. Right. Okay, so the first one, why did she choose me? Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe I, I've never asked her that. Um, but I think the first thing that she said when she came to me was that I want someone who will not judge me, someone who is a listener, someone who will just help me walk through what I'm going through. So she, she stated that very clearly. And I think the first session was, was for her to test me to see whether I'm going to be in a place of judgment. Okay. And I think in next class, when we work on this, we will see that that's one of the biggest principles of counseling is having a non-judgmental attitude. So I'd say that's why she stuck on with me. Um, uh, because there's there's probably uh, there is an acceptance of the person of the individual for who she is, not of the behavior. Never have I condoned and said you know this is good or acceptable or this makes you feel right. This is never that's that's never come uh, as a suggestion from me. The second thing that you said is uh, I think you were asked about the counseling. Uh, how how what what do I do? Yes, I I do not um, I do not work with her, uh, you know, from a Christian uh, background at, at her. However, there are principles um, we bring up for discussions about asking and helping her source out why is she here in this in the first place in in the place that she is in right now. What is what what does she thinks have been her basic core needs that she's attempting to meet through this through these relationships? What what is that she's hoping to achieve out of um, her relationships with this? Uh, her hoping to achieve and receive for herself. So these are questions that that we do discuss, and it helps her to think. It helps her to understand. It's helping her to make choices. So over there, I think that's as far as I have got as of now. I'm just, you know, so one thing that I do for all my clients, whether they're Christian or whether they're not, is to pray and ask the Lord to open up wisdom. And I think while I was talking about this, uh, you know, when you are in counseling, whether it's to a Christian or to anybody else, I mean, God loves them, whether they believe us or not, is that your eye is not just on your counselor, counselee, your eye is on, on the Holy Spirit to help you, guide you in the way that you you deal with them. So there, there are times, you know, I'm praying, I said, Holy Spirit, I don't know what she's up to, and I have no clue how to help her. But give me the right things to say and and show her love despite this. So some of, I think even looking at, you know, the, the ministry of Jesus and how he ministered, he ministered to them in compassion. Okay, and out of that compassion, they began to see themselves and began to see, uh, uh, you know, just because of his compassion, they began to see the sin in themselves. So I believe it's a ministry like that, even if it is to those who aren't believers, you show compassion, you show love, you show acceptance for the person, not again for the behavior, don't get me wrong, Get for the person and value them for who they are, but with, with a sense of love and compassion, helping them deal with them through their problems. 
I believe that the Holy Spirit will one day bring about some form of a form of a change or for a or a or a change in heart. So uh, very difficult to answer that complete question, Christopher, because I'm I'm still dealing with her, and every new session is a is a new eye opener for me um, on the way to focus and to help her to see a little more deeper from from what she seems to be receiving at this point. So some people take longer, some people take shorter, some people don't see it at all. But again, you know, I think the work of a counselor is to know that it's not dependent on you. So earlier I used to be be upset when something doesn't work out or doesn't happen or the counselor is not able to see it. But now you know, I've come to a place of understanding that the Holy Spirit knows best. And if I've been able to work them through certain aspects of their spirit nature, I think I've put in the seed. Yeah, I think that's where I'd like to stop. OK, um, if there are any questions, please do um, um, put up. I think, yeah, uh, Beth, you've put up a question. We'll deal with it next week. I will, I will write that down. Can we quickly just stop with a word of prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this time and for helping us look into the ministry of counseling. Lord, there are many things we may not understand, many ways we may uh, we, we find hard to progress into helping others. But Holy Spirit, we pray that we will be guided and directed by you in helping those who come to us, whether they trust in you or they do not. Because Lord, for you, you love each one as your own children. Lord, I pray for each of us, even as we uh, move ahead in these classes, that you will open our understanding, reveal uh, things to us, us both from your word and both practical, Lord, so that we can work towards what you have called us to do. I bless each student on the call. I pray, God, that you will go ahead of them. Thank you once again. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless. We meet again next week. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am.